Welcome to the Archive series of reviews. Now, the Archive series are a little bit different from the normal reviews you'll see elsewhere in this channel. To see how and why that might be the case, click on the above link. First four and a half minutes will explain all. But without further ado, let's get to this week's review. Welcome to the second in the Archive series of reviews, and I'm looking at an integrated amplifier. Now, this one is just a touch different. Why? Well, the company who makes it no longer exists. They are, or were, Mitchell and Johnson, a UK-based company. They're no longer around, as I say. This particular amplifier, though, can still be found on eBay and also Amazon. Now, when it hit the streets early last year or so, it was retailing at a penny short of £350. And guess what? Even now, you can still find them brand new for £350. You can still find new old stock. Now, the aesthetics look pretty good on this integrated amplifier, but really, is it worth your time and effort to track one of these down? Well, Let's find out. As I say, the aesthetics look pretty good with a neat logo along the top plate. Yes, if you're keen, you can use the top plate as a trampoline. Pressing in the thin gauge metal across the top of the chassis is a bit of a giveaway for budget fur, but there's nothing wrong with that at this price point. All in all, this is a good looking budget release. On the front to the right is a push-in power switch. Next to that is a dual volume knob and input tone selector. That is, that particular control can be rotated and also pushed in. Saw selectors for optical coax. You press this button twice to toggle between each. Auxiliary CD phono amp and line in. Adorn the front and sit underneath the display. To the far left, you'll find a 6.35 millimeter headphone socket and it's nice to see a full-size headphone socket on this model, plus a mini line-in socket. Around the rear now and far left holds the power socket. Running to the right are sturdy speaker terminals, optical and coax inputs, record outs, and five sets of inputs. You'll also find a grounding screw for the phono amplifier, which you'll find on the far right. The remote is remarkably responsive. It has a 30 degree arc of fire, as it were, and a 15 foot range, and features basic controls, but also includes controls for the CDD201V CD player, if you ever find one of those. The remote might be seen by some as an afterthought, but I'd rather have better sound emanating from my amplifier than have an improved remote and lose a bit of sound quality because of build budget restrictions. So Mitchell and Johnson had the right priorities here. Spanning 430 by 80 millimeters by 283. 201V weighs in at 6.3 kilograms and it knocks out about 40 watts of power into eight ohms. Again, for this price point, not a bad set of figures. So how does this thing sound? Well, I picked up a vinyl copy of Everyone Is Everybody Else from Barclay James Harvest on the Polydor label, and I sat down for an extended listen. And I was immediately struck by the very clean and scrubbed general music presentation. I've heard some amplifiers around this price point that can sound a bit warming and a bit stodgy in a classic 70s rock kind of way, but not the 201V amplifier. The mid-range appeared to be lifted up from the ground and set on a pedestal so that the ear could detect information front on, above, below and to the sides. Nothing was hidden here with a mid-range detail offering plenty of clarity and transparency with detail to burn. That's the benefit of just enhancing the mids, of course. But what about bass? Well, there was plenty of that knocking about as well. The beginning of this track offered some very heavy lower bass indeed, and the SAP 201V tracked that area very well. More than that, 
the bass, while retaining a measure of heft, also benefited from focus, which meant that it tended to don a pair of track shoes and shift rather than plod across the soundstage. This also helped the treble area when cymbals were tapped, because the focused bass created room for the treble reverb tails. The result was a more balanced presentation, and one that exuded rhythm and a pleasing tempo. Finally, vocals were rather emotive, and that was probably because you could hear more of the vocal. There was more space for the vocal to do its thing. Hence, diction was enhanced, and the nuances of the performance were there for all to see. And the little vocal emphasis and effort only served to enhance the overall song. Speaking of vinyl, I was using a Goldring E3 cartridge with the internal phono amplifier, and I was pleasantly surprised. It was decent, not amazing, but the internal phono amplifier proved to be a good starter for those on low funds and saving for an external model. On to CD now, and I drafted in Bing Crosby's Bing With A Beat with Bob Scobie's Frisco Jazz Band and the track Let A Smile Be Your Umbrella. That clean mid-range was ever-present here. Be aware that the 201V is pretty darned transparent, so if your CD player has any issues in terms of brightness and the like, then the 201V won't hide or warm it up for you. This box is a truth-telling drug of an amplifier. It'll give sound to you straight. No messing. There was plenty to like here, with the small jazz band offering plenty of verve and energy. Bass was precise, piano was clean and open, percussion was focused and tight, while the clarinet was musical indeed. The Crosby vocal was also full of texture and rich vibrato, conveying the great man's signature delivery and his distinctly humanistic and naturalistic view of singing a song. Now, while the CD was playing, I hooked up a pair of Sennheiser HD650 headphones and did note that as soon as I inserted the plug of the headphones into the amplifier, the actual sound was muted over the speakers. Once up and running, the music over the headphones retained a similar open and fresh approach to the mids with honed and tidy bass. There was a slight roll-off at the upper ends of the frequency spectrum, so the extreme detail was chopped ever so slightly, but this is an internal headphone amplifier after all. If you want performance, buy an external dedicated model. For an internal model though, I was very happy with the headphone amplifier, especially as it provided quite a broad soundstage. I finished in digital mode, plugging my Astell & Kern digital player into the optical port at the rear, and played jamming at 24-bit 96k via Bob Marley. I was impressed by the clarity and the focus of this particular track, but again, the 201V amplifier was at it again. It was telling truths, which is not a bad thing, of course. That is, this music rendition was very good, but not great. And that's exactly what the AK120 is all about on my hi-fi. It performs very well, but it's not true high-end in quality terms. And the 201V amplifier merely confirmed that. That said, bass was solid, with a notable presence and detail, and for a digital music player connected to a reference system, this performance was relatively open and dynamic. So what do I think of the Mitchell & Johnson SAP 201V? Well, an integrated amplifier at this relatively low price point has an almost impossible job to perform. It has to offer a top-notch performance while doing a host of jobs and offering a wealth of features to boot. Yet the 201V does just that. Its clean and open approach to sound allows detail to flow easily, while its precise and transparent nature means that you never lose even a slice of information. The 201V tracks everything and does so efficiently. Easy to use, fully featured and sounding excellent, what more do you really need from a budget amplifier? This amplifier may no longer be on general sale, but it's definitely worth seeking out. And that's it for the second Archive series review. I'll be back next week with another one, number three in the series. Hopefully you can join me then. Love to have your company. Until that time, bye-bye for now. <laughs>